This is the second part of our lecture on languages and grammars. And I believe this is the second and last part, but if we need more, I'll add them. What we talked about last time was what the, uh, a language is, a definition for language. We talked about that there are symbols, which are meaningless marks, alphabets, which are finite sets of symbols, strings, which are sequences of symbols. By the way, those don't have to be finite. We'll deal with finite ones in our class. And then a language, which is simply a set of strings. So again, anytime I ask you, hey, is this a language? The answer is yes, because it's a set of strings. And then we talked about a grammar, which provides rules by which you can produce strings in a language. So the language and the grammar are providing you with the same set of information. The language is the set of strings, and a grammar for that language would produce all and only those sets of strings. The amount of information contained in those two things is the same. It turns out dealing with language definitions is tough. Dealing with grammar definitions, though, is nice and easy and works in a computer, particularly in terms of compilation. So, bacchus nauer form grammars, or BNF grammars. Remember the grammar, the BNF form, is formed of production rules. We have a left-hand side, an arrow, and a right-hand side, and you can replace in your string, if you have something on the left-hand side in your string, you can replace it with the right-hand side. The terminology that we're interested in here are terminals. Terminals are the symbols in the alphabet that you're using. Convention here is to use lowercase. It's called terminal because typically, not always, but typically you will have a grammar that once you have a terminal in the string, you can't keep doing any replacement on it. Now again, that's typical in usage. It, it's not a pure restriction on the definition of a grammar. You could make grammars where terminals uh, continue to be converted into other things or disappear entirely, and we'll talk about those kinds of grammars in a few minutes. Non-terminals, these are intermediary symbols that are getting you towards the string, that are getting you towards the terminal. So a string is going to be a list of symbols in the alphabet or a list of terminals. And along the way, you might have to have some placeholders, some other things. So the convention for the non-terminals is to use uppercase. And then you've got a special non-terminating called the start symbol that indicates the first rule that you have to use. It actually is showing you the first, uh, what your string looks like initially. Think of it like the main method in C or Java. It's the place you got to start. So if you're going to use the grammar to start producing strings, you have to start with the start symbol. We're going to use capital S, uh, which is fairly common, uh, but we'll use capital S, S being a mnemonic for start. So here's a sample grammar, G sub zero, our, our, our first grammar, our zeroth grammar. The alphabet's small, A and B. And there's five rules, and these rules are, we start with the start symbol, right? You have to have a rule for the start symbol. The start symbol can be replaced by capital AB. That's the only way, that's the only replacement we can do. If we have a capital A, we have two choices. We can replace it with a lowercase a, capital A, right? So that's the terminal A followed by the non-terminal capital A. Or we can just replace it with lowercase a, the terminal. Rules two and three, by the way, are very common. They're going to allow you to make strings of A's for as long as you want to. And then rule four and five does, does the same thing with B's. We can, either, we, can keep, we can replace B with lowercase b, capital B. In other words, we can keep making B's. And when we're done, we just replace B with B. So what strings does this produce? What's the language that this thing is describing? The language is the set of all strings composed of A's and B's where all the A's precede all the B's. And you have at least one A and at least one B. That's the language. Once we have these rules, we can start making strings. We can start producing strings. And the terminology that we use is that we derive the string. So using that same grammar we had on the previous slide, let's derive A, B, B, B. The way to do a derivation is to just make two columns. One shows the current string, and then one shows 
the rule that you use to produce that string. So I start with the current string as s. You always start with the start string. And I don't need a rule for that because you always start with the start string. And then if I have s, I want to replace it with something. My only choice is to use rule number one. So I use rule number one and I replace a, a s with a b, non-terminals a b. Then I'm going to use rule four to replace the B, the capital B, with terminal B, capital B. Then I'm going to use rule 4 again. Then I'm going to use rule 5 to replace the capital B with the lowercase b. And the only thing I have to do to get my string is get rid of that capital A to get the lowercase a, and I can use rule 3 for that. So there's a derivation for the string ABB. ABBB. -B -B. We can do another derivation for that. Start with S, go to A, B, and then instead of getting all the Bs first, I'm going to get the A first. So I get the A, I, replace, I use rule 3 to replace non-terminal A with terminal A, and then I use rule 4, rule 4, rule 5 to replace the B with, you know, start manufacturing Bs, uh, and finally use rule 5 at the end to stop, the, to stop it, replacing non-terminal B with terminal B. This is normal. This is okay to have multiple derivations for the same string. That's okay. Here's a slightly different string. Now you can see we're not going to do really long strings in these examples because the derivation gets long, but that's okay. If you know how to do this for fairly short strings, you know how to do this for arbitrarily long strings. We're going to divide, uh, derive A, A, B, B. And again, you can come up with all kinds of different ways, that, or several different ways that you can derive that string. So the way I did it, I start with the start symbol. I don't need a rule for that because you always start with the start symbol. I have to use rule one. That's the only substitution I have for S. So I'm going to go to A, B. And then lower, use rule two to go from capital A to A, A. Then I'll re use rule 3 to re get rid of that ter non-terminal A and get the terminal A. I haven't done anything with the Bs yet. And then I'll use rule 4 to turn that non-terminal B into BB. And then rule 5 to turn the non-terminal B into terminal B. And there's my string AABB. Notice we, con we, we built that string from left to right. That's going to become important in a little bit. Some, some strings you can build from left to right. Some languages you can build all the strings from left to right or from right to left. Some languages aren't that way. And we'll see how that affects the language and the things you can do with that language later on in the course. Okay, so let's do this simple example. Again, we're going to let sigma be a, b. That's pretty standard. It's going to be a, b, or 0, 1 almost the whole semester. Let's do language 1. Language 1 is composed of strings that end in b, b. And then we'll provide a derivation for b, b, and provide a derivation for a, b, a, b, b, b. That's going to be our example. All strings composed of a, b. We don't care what happens ahead of time as long as it ends in b, b. Now, as you're starting to think about how, how would I create a grammar for this, start thinking about what the shortest possible string is. The shortest possible string is BB. So you need a rule that goes right from the start state to BB. Maybe it goes through an intermediary form, but you need a way to get from start to BB. And then start thinking about the next longest string. Oh, okay, uh, the next longest string would be ABB, so I need a way to do that. And then and also BBB. I need a way to do that. Next longest string is of length 4. A-A-B-B, A-B-B-B, B-A-B-B, B-B-B-B, right? You think of all the combinations and then start making up, okay, I need rules that handle all these things. That's the process by which you create these. So I recommend that you pause the video and come up with a grammar. You might come up with a grammar that's different than mine that still does the same thing, and that's okay but pause the video for a minute, come up with your own grammar, and then let's see what happens. Okay, so here's one possible solution, and my thinking was this. I'm just going to make where I can make strings, strings of A's and B's as much as I want, and then when I'm done 
when I get bored with that, right, I can make as many A's and B's as I want in any order, then I'm going to just cap it off with a BB. So my start symbol goes to A. My shortest string in the language is BB, so I can go right from A to BB. And then the rest of these rules, rules two and three, are just there about, okay, I can make A's and B's in any order I want. If I want to derive the shortest string, BB, it's pretty easy. I start with the start symbol. I use rule one to get an A. I use rule four to get BB. If I want to do this longer string, A, B, A, B, 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 I start with S. My only choice is to replace it with an A. And then I'll create the A, that first A. And I'm going to create the string from left to right. I'm going to create that first A using rule two. I'm going to bring the B in there using rule three. Another A, so I use rule two. Another B, so I use rule three. And then, whoops, I got a typo. OK, so we'll ignore the typo. Uh, Pretend I did that right, and I would have the string A, B, A, B, B, B. Now, is that the only derivation for that string? No. Using this grammar, um, oh, wait, it might be for that for that possible one. It's the only, yeah, because I'm creating this string from left to right, and my rules are so constrained. I think that's the only way you can make that. Is that normal? No, it's not normal. Here's a bigger question. How many uh, grammars can we make for that language? Is this the only grammar? Absolutely not. I could create multiple grammars that do the same thing that are non-trivial. I can create an infinite number of grammars, most of which are trivial. But that tells you that, again, the grammar and the language are separate entities. They're separate things. They're giving you the same amount of information, but they're doing it in a different way. So for the language L1, that has, that's a set of strings. It's a set of strings that end in BB. That's what it is. The grammar is a set of production rules that produce strings that end in BB. So that's the same amount of information, but they are two distinct things. And each language can have an infinite number of gra correct grammars for them, most of which are trivial or bloated or inefficient, that kind of thing. OK, so now let's talk about the Chomsky hierarchy briefly. This is a particular grammar. And notice I, this is a grammar that creates strings from left to right. That's not always the case. That's not always possible with certain sets, with certain languages or sets of strings. So let's talk about that. There is something called the Chomsky hierarchy. Chomsky, Noam Chomsky, a linguist, created a hierarchy of languages. This became the foundation for formal language theory. and it's tied to almost everything basic fundamental in computer science world. Theoretical models of computation, theoretical limits of computation, programming languages and compilers, data structures and algorithms. You know, it covers a lot of ground. Now, it's not the only way some of these things are presented, but it ties in perfectly with them. So if we talk about theoretical limits of computation, we're going to talk about a couple ways that, that people have approached that, um, the most famous being the Turing machine. This notion of languages, Chomsky hierarchy, fits in naturally with the notion of Turing machine. Uh, yes, Noam Chomsky's still alive. Um, he's like 187 years old. So briefly, let's introduce the Chomsky hierarchy. We're just going to define it in terms of grammars. There are other ways that we're going to talk about it later on in the semester. But all we know about right now are grammars, so let's talk about that. Basically, the way the Chomsky hierarchy is built in terms of grammars is it puts restrictions on what you can do with those production rules. The left-hand side and the right-hand side are going to have certain restrictions on them. The most sophisticated language is called unrestricted because it has no restrictions on the left or right. It's also sometimes called recursively enumerable. We're not going to talk about that in this course, the terms recursively enumerable. Um, basically, if we were taking a purely theoretical course all the way through, we would spend several weeks on developing this notion of what recursively enumerable is and isn't. Um, basically, it's a way to list um, the set of, uh, of strings that you can create in a language. And it's a way to define limits of computation. 
All right, so let's start with these language characteristics. Regular, regular language. You may have heard the term regular expression. We're talking about a regular language here. Left-hand side must contain exactly one non-terminal. The number of terminals in the right-hand side cannot decrease. And you have to be able to create at least one grammar where the strings are derived from left to right or right to left. Notice this last example we did. This thing produces strings from left to right. It's a regular grammar. And that means because we can create a regular grammar, the language itself is regular. I have to remember to turn my mail off when I do these recordings. Okay, the second one is context-free. We'll talk about why context-free and context-sensitive in, 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 in a future lecture. But context-free is very similar to regular. Left-hand side contains exactly one non-terminal. Number of terminals on the right-hand side cannot decrease. What's the rule that we got rid of? This rule that you have to go from left to right or right to left. You may be able to make strings where you build them up in the middle. You build them out. Or you build on one end for a while, you build on the other end for a while. Context-sensitive. Left-hand side now, not just one exactly one non-terminal. You can have terminals and non-terminals, or multiple, multiple non-terminals, multiple terminals and non-terminals. But the rule that the number of terminals on the right-hand side cannot decrease holds. We still have that rule. And then, unrestricted, as you would suspect, anything goes. It's, it's just Thunderdome, right? No restrictions. We're going to talk about what these different categories of languages mean, what they do, uh, what they, what, how they contribute to computation. Uh, we'll go through the next section of the course after this where we talk about models of computation um, and how each of these categories correspond to a, mo a specific model of computation and to the notion of computability. Uh, and then um, finish up with the, uh, working our way up to the Turing machines and the, and the unrestricted um, grammars and languages. How do you know if a language is context-free? How do you know if it's regular? Oh, if you can build at least one grammar that is regular, then the language is regular. If you can build at least one language that is a uh, grammar that is context-free, then the language is context-free. Basically, the, 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 the the higher in type number you can go. That's where the language sits. If I have a regular language, can I build a context-sensitive grammar for it? Probably, and it's probably stupid to do it, but I could, we could probably do it. You want to have the, the most efficient and the best match grammar. Okay, that's it for this lecture. Um, I will add more about Chomsky hierarchy and what that means later on in the course.